Hey, you can do a video of this. We're live, everybody. What is up? I am beyond honored to have Mr. Donnie V, formerly of Enough is Enough, with me. How you doing, buddy? Pretty good for my age. How about yourself? Not too bad. Not too bad. You know, just riding out this apocalypse with everybody else is waiting for them to open up the storm gates again so we can get back out there playing to everybody. Were you out playing a lot? Yeah, uh, I've got a couple bands that are pretty heavily in rotation. Uh, the one I've been playing with the most before the lockdown, I've got a Guns N' Roses tribute band, which you can see that top hat behind me, uh, that we, we kind of do the whole East Coast runs and all that stuff. So that's who I was kind of gigging with the most before the lockdown. And we actually had a pretty solid 2020 for us, just like a lot of people did. And now it's uh, kind of everything's getting rescheduled, as you know, and but there's silver lining to it. So now I've got Monfield with Todd Kearns and the guys from Ace Fraley's band. So it's uh, there's silver lining to everything. You can't go wrong with that. It's a bunch of good players there. Absolutely, absolutely. So have what we met? Have we met in the past? We have not. Uh, okay. So I, I have played some sh gigs with Enough's Enough, but it's been here recently within the oh, last year or two. Got, so. Diet, diet enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. yeah. Chip and the boys. We'll just, we'll just, we can call them that during the interview if you want. <laughs> hey, you can ask me anything you want. It's cool. Well, cool. So what have you been up to during the lockdown, buddy? I know some artists are taking this time to, you know, grab the bull by the horns and record a bunch of music and some are just kind of relaxing. So what's Donnie V been doing? A little of both. You know, I'm tracking a new one right now. Um, actually two and, I just got to get off my ass and start working more because everything's like as in a lull and you really can't go one way or the other. And so uh, there's no fire underneath me to get, you know, when, once there is, I, you know, turn it up and out. But like I just bought out of all my record deals and stuff and I have all my stuff again, plus the enough's enough deal and shit. And so it's uh, a little different not knowing, you know, uh, having to take care of all of that uh you know, expenses and all that shit and decisions and things like that or what to do. And a lot of that's up to me now. And, um, you know, we got a single and a video ready to go. That's, that's, that's really fucking incredible. And, uh, but it's not, the, the timing has to be right to release this one. So I'm, I'm think I'm, uh, I'm tracking one now to see if I can't push something out first, you know, because it's been quite a while since, uh, put something out. Yeah, so your last album came out in 2019, and it was a fantastic record, so I'm definitely looking to hear some more stuff, and if I'm correct, the single you're referring to is Party Time, right. and uh, Chips Enough is actually playing bass and appearing in the music video, if I'm correct, so... Uh, I want to know what's it kind of been like, I know the, over the last year or so, you and Chip have actually started working on some more stuff together. And I know the the deal with Cleopatra and all that stuff has kind of reconnected you guys a little bit, but you've got the new Zenough record and the, you sing on a song in it, Strangers in My Head, arguably might be my favorite song on the record. And then, you know, you've got Party Time coming out. So talk to me what it's been like uh, reconnecting with Chip over the last year or so. Well, I don't know if, you, if the, the right way to phrase it would be that we're necessarily working together because we're uh, nothing's, it's not like he's here or yeah. I'm there and we're doing stuff that's, uh, you know, via email and things like that. And so, um, you know, it's like, it's a perfect relationship at this point right now is he likes doing what he's doing. I like doing what I'm doing. But at the same time, I, I can still have the best bass player in the world without all the fucking, <laughs> without everything that comes attached to it. And so I, it's a, it's a good, I like the situation it works for me and I guess it works for him and, and we don't have to put up with each other. <laughs> you know, we did for a lot of years, but it's good that we're, uh, that we're talking again and we, you know, we communicate, you know, once a week or whatever and a little small talk, little this, little that and. He likes to stay away from talking about any kind of business things, you know, which which I don't like talking about, but I don't blame him for staying away from talking business with me, you know, because that's not anything that I want to have to talk about with me. But uh, but it is cool and uh, it makes me feel a lot better than I did or some things that just really needed to get worked on, you know, and um, and so, uh, you know, like I always said, I love loving him more than I hate hating or than I love hating him. So, you know, so it's cool. Yeah, it's all cool. Awesome. You know, it's it's great hearing stuff like that where 
despite your guys' rocky relationship in the past, you were still – you don't care to compliment his playing just as if you guys were still in a band together. And I think that's something when you see – you know, duos in a big band like that after they have fallings out or something like that. You know, two guys that are really stuck together, their names in a band like you and Chip have, where after the relationship might go south for a little while, you know, you don't necessarily hear stuff like that. But it's always refreshing to hear comments like that from you where you love loving him more than you hate hating right. him. Well, you got you, you to understand that, that desperate times – call for desperate actions and and when you got people working out of desperation you gotta you said through the ups and downs well a lot of it has been more more downs than there were ups with the band and everything and so uh we've uh you know that brings out a, a rougher side of people and um things are a little more each little decision is a little more crucial to each guy and so we you know there was a lot of uh i had a lot of issues you know personal issues and shit like that and um he's got his issues you know and uh so we spent a lot of time dealing with those you know each other's you know things and uh and so of course it's gonna after so long you know we're 30 years you know since we've uh i think it's old it's been like 32 or 33 years since the, since we hooked up chip and i and so you know it's uh so that was a long run you know, and we've we've seen a lot of the, the alleys and dirt roads together, you know, and so um, if you can get your head into a different spot, we're not quite in that desperate frame of mind. And uh, plus a lot of the issues that I had, I, I've cleared those up, you know, I've got my shit together and healthy and stuff like that, you know, so it's really easier dealing with me, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think I'm that easy to deal with, but Usually only if somebody's fucking my shit up. <laughs> hey, man, that's rock and roll, though. You can't have your lead singers any other way. <laughs> uh, so, cool. Yeah, we touched on it a little bit, the deal with Cleopatra. You guys have uh, some reissues coming out through them on some very cool-looking vinyl. Uh, kind of brief everybody on how this deal came about and what it's been like working with those guys over at Cleopatra. Um, I'm not absolutely positive how it – exactly how it came about all i know is i i got it uh you know chip contacted me and let me know that it was it started out with the dissonance record that they wanted to do that and so i do believe it was that and um might have been that and animals might have done the two at a, at a time but i'm not i don't remember i think it was covered in gold that came out first with uh dissonance. on that record on that uh, label yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure i saw it on the website today whenever i was scrolling through it covered in shit is what I call it. That's like the worst fucking record. It's like the worst, worst selections of, of worst vocals performances that I have out there. You know what I mean? It's those. I'm a fan of some of the stuff on there. I thought you did a really fantastic job on the John Lennon cover, Jealous Guy. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed your guys' version of that. Well, thank you. You know, it's just uh, with how many songs that we have to be releasing a record like that. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't see the, See, it's still shit like that is, is the differences, you know what I mean? But uh, I wasn't even aware that they'd put that out. But, yeah, Chip contacted me, let me know this was going down and stuff. And so it started progressing. And the next thing they wanted was uh, the rest of the catalog. And so I like the idea of that. So we know where everything's at. And now ducks are all in a row. They're up and they're on the up and up. And, uh, you know, st start seeing actually something that you've never seen before, which are royalty checks, and <laughs> publishing checks and stuff like that, you know, so it's cool. I'm looking to do the same thing with my, with my old solo catalog. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to some new information on that when it becomes available. Uh, so let's talk about these two records a little bit. Uh, that are coming out through Cleopatra, the Pete's fuzz and the dissonance. So dissonance, Jakey Lee played guitar on that. Uh, what was it like working with him on this record? Was he helping with the songwriting or was he just coming in and playing leads after the fact? What was the whole vibe around this record? Uh, around the making the distance record, there's some really ugliness involved in that. That was my, my first comeback to the band after I the first had this from the band for like six years and came back into that situation without going into all the fuckery and this and that. It was it was it was looking like a failed attempt to uh get it back together and uh 
And then some, some things happened. I took some time away from it and kind of like shelved it. And, uh, and I came, you know, I went on a writing role and got out there on my own. And uh, so Vinny, the Vinny Costaldo, the drummer and the engineer and mix and all that stuff for that record. Um, I went out there and he and I made, started making the dissonance record the way, the one that you hear now, you know, and uh, Jake was a good friend of, uh, of Vinny's and he'd hang out at the studio now and then. And, uh, and I knew him too from, uh, you know, we toured with Jake and Badlands and stuff, you know, we were early in the career. And so it was cool. He's a pretty quiet dude, you know, he didn't say a whole lot, but he was hanging out a lot. And, um, and he's just, you know, one time I just said, Hey Jake, you know, we were doing a song I think called Joni Lynn. And uh, it was just he and I and uh, Vinny and uh, my other buddy, uh, CJ, because I did one of those uh, dive bar nights out in Vegas where they have you come out and guest star for a thing. And we were so fucking high. I don't know what, <laughs> oh my God, were we high on everything? We went back to the studio, of course, and tracked and track Joni Lynn. High as fucking kites, so, though, but uh, I don't necessarily think about that when you listen to the song. But I threw the guitar at Jake. I, you know, I was. I'm not really a lead guitar player as you know like he is and so i was like hey man you you, you mind blowing a dig on this one and he uh and he did and it was like the first take was amazing you know what i mean i was like that'll do that's great that's perfect and uh it just slowly you know uh one thing i've learned from chip you know is you get an inch take a mile <laughs> it just started going uh hey about this one this one that too and next before before we were done it ended up him playing reinforcing all the guitar on the record, you know, and a lot of main major songs on there. And, um, and it sounded really fat, really thick, you know what I mean? And so, uh, no, but he's, uh, there was nothing involved in the songwriting or anything like that. I wasn't, wasn't involved to that kind of capacity. It's almost like a hired gun that didn't get paid. <laughs> well, it's a great record and I appreciate you sharing that story with me. So, uh, Let's talk a little bit more about the Cleopatra stuff. So you shared in the email with me that there is a Enough Z Enough box set coming out through Cleopatra. Uh, can you give me any information on what it's going to totally entail? Well, I go through my manager, so I have absolutely <clears throat> zero hands-on contact with that label. I'm looking to change that real soon. And um, so I don't really have a lot of answers or information for you and uh but i never usually do that's just not my forte you know i i do this here and after that you know it's i just you know i put my faith in uh, other people but i'm trying to get better at that stuff but i i don't know exactly their uh their plans i do know the box set though is coming and, and i know they're working hard on that and i hope that would be really cool if they released that in vinyl a whole yeah. box set in vinyls you know i think that'd be cool but it's a lot of cool stuff on it. It's all been corralled stuff that only huge fans would have had for bootleg stuff and traded this and that. All of that stuff is being conglomerated into one big box set. And so, you know, there's a lot of cool shit. There's a lot of shit that I wouldn't really have chosen for anybody to hear, you know, but after all these years now, it's like it's little baby pictures. So you can think of it that way. Yeah, it's a absolutely. lot of cool shit, you know. Very cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And like you said, I really hope it comes out on vinyl. Uh, it's like we were talking about before you started, some of these records you couldn't get on vinyl when they came out. So it's it's cool seeing Cleopatra do stuff like that. Are you, are you a big vinyl collector yourself? Dude, I don't think I've ever, I've never bought a record in my life. I was, when I was a kid and used to listen to a lot of records, I was too broke. I would, we didn't have any money. I didn't have records. I would take my little cassette recorder and record other people's records bring them home and listen to them like that and learn, learn shit like that off of little cassettes and stuff. And uh, then later on, you know, I had no interest in, in listening to stuff because we're doing our own stuff and shit like that. And um, people have given me their CDs and shit, but I've never, uh, I've never bought a CD or a record in my life. I don't believe in. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, so you talk about listening to music when you were a young kid. Uh, I want to kind of dive into your early history a little bit while we're on that kind of area. Uh, so what were some of the first, uh, you know, exposures to rock and roll a young Donnie V had that kind of catapulted you in this direction? Um, well, like I've said, a million different interviews. It was, uh, it was a Beatles record. You know, I'd heard a Beatles record and I was so young that people can't even 
can't, you know, uh, understand that I actually was hearing and picking this stuff up and, and my tunnel vision started when I heard that first fucking record. It just, all of a sudden I had a, I found a zone, you know, I didn't have any zone. It was, it wasn't the most pleasant childhood and I found a zone and that's, that uh, guided me through everything else in my life, but through the rock and roll zone and through the musical zone, you, there's a lot of strange roads, you know, down that road. And so uh, it did guide me through that. But, um, you know, I learned a lot from those records and, and the Motown records and the early stuff and AM radio and things like that. Anything I get my hands on and uh, learned a lot about melody and structure of songs and and harmonies and orchestration and things like that, which I didn't know I was learning at the time. You know I mean, I'm just, it's just, it was just getting embedded. And, um, you know, a lot of musicians, I don't know when they started, but people say, oh, daddy, he's so lucky. It just comes to him. I started so fucking young. Like when I was crawling, I was, I was starting this, you know what I mean? And so, uh, and that's all I thought about every minute of every day up until it happened, you know what I mean? And, uh, still to this day you know so it was that and slowly other records started coming into play through my friends and guys we'd start to play together and shit and start introducing like Led Zeppelin and uh, Rush and things like that and I was like it opened up a whole new thing now I hadn't gone down those roads and stuff so musically I started expanding and um, I don't know if I answered your question I don't know if you remember the question but I was just asking what some of your first uh, exposures to rock and roll music were that kind of led you in that so you you answered it very well that's kind of the perfect answer I was looking for so when you started playing music did you start out singing or were you playing guitar first and kind of started singing after that well in my world I was singing from right from the get-go okay. you know and uh, and so that was my thing I was very insecure and a shy kid, scared of things, so I didn't have the balls to actually sing in front of anybody till I was already in in a band, maybe two, second band I was in. Where I was the guitar player, and I sucked on guitar. I still suck on the guitar, and uh, and I would cringe listening to these guys singing. You know, I was like, "Jam, you know, man, I know I could kill these guys singing, you know, but uh, I didn't have the balls to do it." Then comes alcohol. You get a little more balls when you have alcohol and a good buddy of mine tricked me into singing and that then I was the singer ever since. You know. That's great. And you know, it's it's funny how many of those stories you hear where guys that are singers didn't start at singers. It's something that just kind of became available. And you know, you hear stories like that. So it's kind of crazy how coincidental that kind of seems well, to be universally. Singing, like I said, it was in my world and in my zone, singing was, was always number one. It was the first thing. And I knew that it was inevitable that one day I was going to have to break out of that and be the singer, you know, if, if I wanted to get anywhere. Because I knew I kicked the ass and I knew the other guys didn't, you know. And I, like I said, I was singing since I could talk. And, uh, you know, with all this little knowledge embedded into me and stuff, when I started singing, I was ready to go. And, uh, I mean, you know, I sang really well the very first time anyone ever heard me. And, um, you know, writing songs and started coming in. And, and once you're writing, you have to sing them. You know what I mean? Again, if somebody else, these bozos singing my shit too like that. And so, you know, uh, it's, but it's always been my main thing. And I still consider that my main instrument to this day. And I play everything else, but out of just out of necessity. <laughs> Absolutely. If I, get, if I can get somebody else to play it, I will, you know. <laughs> of course. So uh, while we're kind of on that earlier history of the band and everything, uh, I've got Mr. Alex Kane coming on the show in about a week. And Alex, if I'm not mistaken, was the last guitarist in Enough's Enough before Derek Frigo joined the band. Uh, are there any uh, memories that kind of stick out from your time with Alex in the band and that whole period of the band, uh, certain stuff that stick out in uh, your recollection of that time period? Well, um, when Chip and I first got out with Enough's Enough, we had another lineup. We had uh, original guys, such as Gene and Bo. And at the time, what was going on visually and things in the, in, uh, in the industry and stuff, like they didn't really fit that criteria, plus they weren't going to, going to move over to uh, going out there without a net. You know what I mean? They needed their steady thing and stuff. And Chip was like, hey, we're going for it. You know what I mean? And so um, Alex came along there. I, I was kind of pursuing him for a while because of some bands that he was in. And I really liked his moves and his uh, attitude and, and stuff. And um, like that was, that was the first time I ever was like 
the center stage of uh, playing with professionals and everything. You know, enough enough is really my first real band. And um, he and I uh, lived together for a while. We lived at his little, uh, he had a little uh, apartment downstairs from building his mother owned. And we slept in the same, we had the same big old bed. This one room was just a big bed. And we just sit in there and watch movies and shit. And we had a thing called the moat, which we don't cross over the side of the moat. You know, because <laughs> woke up using my moat a couple of times. But uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun. And Alex a very funny character and uh, interesting guy. And we've had our ups and downs. But for the most part, uh, I was always a, a big supporter of Alex being in the band. And, um, and the way things happened, it didn't turn out that way. But I've always loved Alex. Very yeah. cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, so let's fast forward a little bit. I want to kind of, we'll skip over the first album and I want to talk about strength a little bit. So this album came out in 1991 and this was kind of like, you know, the same year Nevermind came out and Grunge is really just kind of taking, taking, you know, taking the bull by the horns as we can call it. So what kind of vibes were you getting from the label and everybody knowing that this record kicked so much ass, but you know, the mainstream music had kind of shifted away from the style of music you guys were playing. We were uh, working so much and we were playing and touring and everything. So we kind of were oblivious to all of that other stuff coming at, coming in and what we were doing. And um, you know, all of a sudden at that point, the strength of what we were doing, and that other stuff happening in the rest of the world that weren't really aware of, all of a sudden now we're pussies. As we're here, we're making this masterpiece in our eyes. And, and, and we know that, you know, we'll give those guys a run for their money as far as their personal issues and shit like that, you know, and could have, could have slapped together a grunge record really early and early on, but like I didn't know what was going on. And, and, uh, you know, just kind of and a, a lack of direction from labels as far as visually and stylistic. And um, that's where they both of them dropped the ball, you know, and tried. And, um, and it was kind of killed me because like this Nirvana and all that stuff's coming out. And it's like, I'm a big piece of shit like these guys too. I don't like dressing up in fancy clothes. You know what I mean? I do drugs. You know, I write heavy shit. I have angst stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm out there with my butterfly net, you know, and, and flowered pants and stuff like that, you know, so uh, it was, you know, later on as, after the next couple of records, you can see that I started, you know, uh, bringing out that side too. But Strength was, was a great experience. We made that record in California. It was our first time away from home for any period of time, like staying somewhere in one spot in California is a, I'm sure you've been there. It's a hell of a place to be when you're, uh, when you're on top of the world, you know, I mean, it was a big party. So, um, but it was, it was a lot of fun making it. We had a good producer and, and um, I got to move up the totem pole as far as production and, uh, and uh, the power and the, the musical aspects of the band, you know, I, I rose up the ranks there. And um, uh, a lot of people still, still credit that record is uh, like ahead of its time or a good, the way that we put together, uh, you know, real orchestration and shit like that. But see, there's reverts back to growing up listening to the Beatles and things like that. All that kind of orchestration, strings and all that stuff was in my head. I could hear that stuff. And so I don't think without Paul Lanny being involved as producer, we would even delve into that stuff. And I'm glad that we did. Yeah, it's a fantastic record, man. It's uh, lots of good stuff on there. The World is a Gutter is on my daily playlist. That's one of the first songs I listen to when I wake up every day. You, you look like a guy that would play World is a Gutter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and what resonates resonates. That's, you know, that's what, how it works around here. Uh, so, you know, I've watched some of the other interviews you've done here in the last year or two, and I think you talked about you had mentioned to chip possibly maybe doing a few shows with the lineup of you chip johnny and vic and i think you said that it had fell on deaf ears a little bit is this something you'd still be open to doing in the right situation right now i'm open to doing anything that makes sense to do with a good reason to do it uh i don't think that uh that necessarily would be a lineup that if I, my dream lineup, you know what I mean? Or it's uh, like Vic, I haven't played with him in so many years and um, he's a great drummer and everything. It's not anybody I'd want to be in cahoots with anymore business wise or 
you know, I mean, uh, I don't know, as far as musically, I don't know what he's into anymore, but um, Johnny Monaco was always, uh, he's like my little mini me, you know, he took over left at, when I left the band and um, he's a very talented little guy, you know what I mean? Um, he, like I am, uh, we stand in, stand in our own way a lot, you know what I mean? And he, he does that same thing, but uh, that would, it would be a good, that'd be a good, you know, as far as, you, you know, you're putting it, putting the show on sale, you know, you got three original guys and obviously Derek couldn't be there, you know, and uh, the, the idea that I'd come up with was because uh, these, these guys that did uh, the, the hologram shit for, uh, <clears throat> for uh, Dio, this hologram show and stuff that contacted me and I didn't really talk to them much, but I think that they were kind of uh, hinting towards uh, us being able to do a full reunion with a hologram of Derek and stuff like that. That's where my ideas started turning and, uh, wow. like, you know, Hey, we could, you know, there's, <clears throat> especially with all the animosity and shit between the band and stuff that, uh, I know that that, that show, just like any show, if I got back with the band, you know, just for a, a few select shows, they would be, they would be successful shows and it would be a good reason to do it. You make a lot of money it, you know, it would be jam packed. It would be and for the fans too. I know that's, that's the aspect that I look at everything from the fans' point of view, and I know that they would love to see that, especially what they'd been seeing for the past few years, you know. And uh, see, but um, just like uh, I said, that'd be some everybody else's feelings as well. That when, if there's a reason to do it and it'll make sense to do it, and uh, then then we could probably do it, you know. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, thanks for diving into that. I know that can be a sticky subject for some people, but thank you for uh, kind of. It, it, it was that. at one time. <laughs> well, very cool. You know, it's it's nice to see uh, you you outgrow situations and you lose animosity and stuff like that over time. Most people do. We won't say everybody does, but we'll say we'll say some people do. So it's always nice to hear things like that, where you've mentioned before at one point that door was nailed shut. But, you know, in the right situation, really anything could be possible. Yeah, well, I mean, anything could be possible. You know, you suck a dick for the right money. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's great. You, just, you can't ever say never. <laughs> so let's 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 say hypothetically this does happen. Uh, this is just a fun little question. Let's say enough's enough goes back out on the road with you on vocals. I want to know Donnie V's dream enough's enough tour. You guys get that tour together. Which band are you taking out on the road with you? What what opening band? Sure. Or you could even take a take a bigger headliner out with probably you probably bring you guys out with us and uh, perfect <laughs> yeah. perfect. I don't know. If, I would imagine if we did anything, I would my I would if I was a betting man, I would say probably Japan would be the first target to go after, and uh, you know, uh, like the states. It's you know that you know what the state of the music business and industry is. You know what I mean? So. We kind of, uh, if we're going to do something, we better do it relatively soon well, because our fans are old and dying, you know, so, so you're not getting any uh, little kids out there, but I don't know about a dream tour. I don't, any tour in that situation would, would not be a dream for me, you know, shows, events, you know what I mean? That would be cool. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting back in a van or a bus or anything with a bunch of, <laughs> bunch of cheesy dudes, you know. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit of this music that you're working on nowadays. Uh, you talked that you're playing a lot of uh, the instruments out of necessity, like a lot of guys that are recording at their home studio right now. But are there any other musicians besides Chip that you're working with that you can let us know about? Well, on party time, uh, we got Roger Manning from, from uh, Jellyfish doing Very all cool. the brass and the keyboards on it and stuff. And we got Chip. I got my drummer, Greg, Greg Potter, he's a really great drummer. I've known him from since he's the guy that Vicky Fox learned his, all his moves and shit from, you know, so I don't know. I can't remember exactly how we hooked back up, but uh, yeah, he's very, he's really good. Chip's great. I mean, Roger, you know, I got Mike Full and the guy that people don't realize how important the guy behind the board is. You know what I mean? It's the difference. The same song could be this 
you know, I mean, we originally had a track party time, originally had that, that single ready to go and they pulled it and I didn't let the label put it out. Once we started shooting the video and the video started coming out so great, I was like, this track needs to be, to come up to the next level to match up with the video. And so I started thinking, all right, I'm gonna have to shell out some extra money to get Tholen to, you know, to produce and engineer it and mix it and stuff. But like, like I was saying that the original version of it was great, it's a marketable song, this and that, it's just the difference of having that guy behind the board of what he does. He's so great at doing what he does is, is like as well as I do what I do. And so it makes a difference in the world that the song is just, it's a whole different song. It's a whole different element. And, you know, and uh, instantly as soon as he was going to remix it, he started looking at all my tracks and my tracks are fucking clusterfuck of shit. I'm pretty unconventional when it comes to, to this stuff. And uh, he's like, man, he goes, I can't mix this shit. He goes, what are you, says we're gonna have to get you so he sent it goes you got to play your guitars over so i had to play my guitars i'm like well let's get chip to play the bass i i gave chip a, a ring and he said sure i'll do it you know i figured he would he likes to like to have his uh his spray on everything you know what i mean and so uh <laughs> came out really good but uh on the beautiful things record i had a lot of a lot of different cats playing on there and you know matt walker uh paul gilbert Chilt Roger, Joseph Manning, uh, Johnny Polanski. Uh, I can't remember everybody that's on it, but it was, it was a great lineup of people. Very cool. Yeah, it was a great record, and I'm really looking to hearing some follow-up music to that one. And I know you said that you're uh, talking around trying to get your back catalog for your solo stuff re-released. So we got lots of cool stuff coming up in the world of Donnie V here in the near future. So lots of cool music to be indulging in. Well, making records is, is cost, people don't realize that that at the bare minimum, uh, you know, just skin and bones, it's, it costs money. Oh, it's, I mean, you it's, gotta, it's pretty, yeah. it, it can get crazy once you start diving into it, man. I mean, not yeah. like the old days, 150, 200,000 hours to make a record, which is ridiculous. You know what yeah. I mean? That, that, yeah, you, would, you wouldn't I, make that back in 10 years nowadays. <laughs> you, do it, you do it now on, on two weeks, two weeks food budget from those days. You know what I mean? Do the yeah. record, but you got to got to hire out, you know, they got to get other cats to play, got to have studio for certain stuff, you know, you still got to have a studio for drums, shit like that, and other people, they're not going to play for free, you know, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys, and, um, and so making a whole record on my own dime is, is something that, uh, it's not real practical, plus, I think making whole records these days isn't really even practical idea, because, because uh, at least one thing, you can't download a, a final record. You know? So those, <laughs> those at least will get sold. But uh, so I'm, I'm just right now for this time being, I have a backlog of a lot of great new stuff. It's just uh, just going with one song at a time for now, as long as I have full control over it and I don't have some uh, some labels and you know involved in this and that. Uh, I think a song at a time is does the job. You know what I mean? You can make the rounds of PR and this and that, and you get that, get your thing out there and stuff. You put like beautiful things, you know, it's like that label was, was questionable, you know what I mean? And there's a lot of wasted songs there. And, and I don't want to, it's another thing. I don't want to give up on that record. So we were planning, getting ready to tour or play shows when the pandemic hit. And, uh, you know, so I don't even remember what I was trying to say. It's uh, uh, talking singles. about beautiful. Oh, I, yeah, I don't want. I, I didn't want to give up on that. So these these newer newer singles are kind of in in support of that record. You know what I mean? They're not on the record, but they're in support of that. Very cool. So uh, stylistically, how would you compare the new stuff that you're working on to albums like Beautiful Things and your more recent work? Well, just like everything I've done since uh, since the 1985 record all the way up until now, I I just when whatever the the new wave of songs that comes and song ideas comes at me, they basically, like I've always said, I follow the songs. I let the songs dictate and tell me what they want to be, how they want to sound, what kind of style they are. And so there's, uh, you know, I've got different stuff. I've got some heavier new stuff. I've got some lighter new stuff. And I'm trying to kind of picking the side of the fence, you know what I mean? And um like the beautiful things record was it was exactly what I'd always envisioned myself doing and I and it's like very proud of that record I think it's the best thing I've ever done and uh, the most sensible made sensibly made record and um 
keep forgetting the question. Hey, I, just got, I, I just got up a little while. This is my morning. Hey, I woke up about 45 minutes before this interview. No feel bad. Uh, the other night I was talking to uh, Dan Hill, the current drummer in Zenuff, and it happened to me for the first time. It was just like I was asking a question and then just all of a sudden my mind just went blank. <laughs> and, the current drummer from who? Uh, enough's enough. Uh, Dan what, Hill. Daniel oh, Hill. I've never met him. He's a uh, he's he's from Chicago. Uh, from what he told me, Hillman uh, Ship had joined a local band together around fourteen when Zenoff kind of quit playing around that time. So he yeah. was playing in uh, it was a band called Super Big in Chicago with uh, Chip. So that's how those two guys got linked up. But uh, yeah, right in the middle of our interview, I asked a question and started to and just completely like blanked out, lost my train of thought. And yeah, I was like a deer in the headlights for a second or two. So don't with feel him? bad about, yeah, that, that happens, uh, yeah, man. So well, we'll you see. guys should be sitting there with a heart on now with me. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, man, there's a reason like I only, huh? there's, there's a reason this, this camera is only the top half of my body. <laughs> <laughs> Well, very cool. Uh, so, uh, you know, I always kind of like to end these things with some more fun questions, you know, instead of just like uh, strict to the book and all that stuff. So kind of bouncing back to the Cleopatra stuff, uh, the two two records that are coming out with those guys, Pete's Fuzz and Dissonance. Let's talk about the opening tracks. Let it go off of Pete's Fuzz and then Dissonance off of that record. I want to know which one's your favorite opening track out of the two. Oh, Dissonance, hands down, though. Uh, Let It Go was originally going to be the first single off uh, Strength. Oh, wow. And, okay. and, it got, and it got dropped, and uh, it didn't sound right. That song was never quite finished as far as I was concerned, you know, lyrically. And there were some other things that just hadn't been fine-tuned, you know. And so uh, I opted for uh, one that we had had in our, catalog, in our live set for since we just began. It was Baby Loves You, and I opted to throw that on there instead of... Uh, let it go, and um, and with that came came another couple of songs. To believe heaven or hell, I wrote that on on the plane on the way home, and uh, I was like, this it needs something else. Oh, wow. it needs, yeah, it needs. There's a couple elements of something. It's not in. It sounds like a completely different band than our first record. I said we need to kind of uh, evolve, you know, and that's what I keep doing. I keep evolving, and and um, like I make sure that I don't retouch on the same thing, and uh, something might sound a similar style, but if you listen closely, you'll see that there's there's an, there's an evolution there. Absolutely, and you can definitely hear that across a lot of this your catalogs. My, so. This one is my favorite Enough Enough record. Oh wow, like, really? That's the last Enough Enough record I consider that was made, okay. and uh, and it's my favorite one. And um, I just think we fi finally found the Enough Enough niche with that record. There, you know, there was always had our sound, and everything, but that was exactly what I was aiming for, what we were aiming for from the very beginning. And, uh, you know, it's an intelligent record. It's, you know, it's heavy and it's solid. And that's a power pop record at its finest, I do believe. That's great. I didn't know that that was your favorite record out of the catalog. If there was anything you could change about that record, though, is if there even is any, what is the, what would you change about it? It was about three songs that I wouldn't be on it. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> a couple other things would be on there. You know what I mean? That's the only thing that kills it for me is a few songs that, uh, I had no idea we're going on that record until I had a copy of it in my hand. And that is, that's the kind of shit like that, that uh, okay. it's impossible for me to deal with. You know what I mean? And, but other than that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's two thirds, the great best enough enough record. You know what I mean? I'm, not to say, you know, uh, <laughs> that's all I'll say. That's great. Yeah. That's fantastic. You, uh, you know, cause most people would assume that one of the first three albums would probably have been your favorite, but that's very cool here. And one of the later catalog, uh, well, a lot yeah. of artists that probably would be their favorite. Cause those are probably up until your first record. That's your greatest hits up until that point, uh, you know, <clears throat> and a lot of records, a lot of bands, I don't, they don't go as I'm up. I'm not over 20 records now that, that I, I consider, uh, at least live up to, eat their previous records or predecessors and I try to top it each time and so of course that my re favorite records are going to be you know just like you, you look back on your career and uh, you know when you were a kid of course that's not your best moments you know but luckily I'm still having a peak I'm still uh, improving at this age you know what I mean so 
Very cool. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to getting some new music from the Donnie V camp. Uh, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, man. I really appreciate you coming on here. It's been an honor talking to you for a little while. Uh, so before we get out of here, let everybody know where they can find you on social media and check out all your stuff. Uh, .ev.com. You can get to Facebook. You can get uh, <laughs> Twitters. You can get Spotify. You can get, uh, I don't know, iTunes. Anywhere you can get somebody else's stuff, you know, you can, <laughs> you can get my shit, you know, and uh, just keep your eyes peeled. Very cool. Is there any potential timeline you can give us for releasing new music possibly? Like I said, we're ready to go right now with this song and this single and uh, video, but the song like Party Time, it's a very marketable song. It's, uh, it's probably the most marketable thing I've ever written, which has oh, wow. potential and, and possibilities beyond just uh, being a, you know, another song to my repertoire. It has very commercial ability, uh, commercial ability and uh, like hopefully to get a commercial or something like that. And so you can't waste a song like this you know what i mean it, it, with the wrong timing without having the right setup you know we're still still uh you know not sure of which way we're going with as far as promoting it and stuff but it's definitely going to get as much as we can have put into it and uh otherwise like i said it's ready to go <laughs> very cool well awesome donnie i thank you so much for coming on here me and you will be able to say goodbye off the air after the episode's end but uh I appreciate everybody tuning in tonight. Like I said, I got Mr. Donnie V here with me, formerly of Enough's Enough. Uh, Donnie, thank you so much for coming on here tonight, brother. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks for thinking of me. And uh, it's the first interview we've done with no pants. <laughs> That's why we got to say goodbye off camera. You know? <laughs> in, ten, in 10 years, we'll milk the director's cut release where it shows the bottom half of us. And we'll, we'll cast Woo! it on that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cool. All right. Thank everybody for tuning in. I will see you back here tomorrow night with Mr. Zach Russell. Thank you guys so much.